So, again, this is Steve Marzoff, the Integrated Services Program Director from uh, uh, from VITA. Um, today we have uh, Tom Gagnon uh, from the uh, State Interoperability Office to give an update on Comlink. Um, I ask that uh, if you all can mute your phones. Uh, if you have a question, I'm sure Tom won't mind you interrupting and, and asking it. But uh, if you're not talking, if you could mute your phone so that um, uh, we don't get the background noise and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, uh, if uh, you know, we are recording the, the presentation as well, and we'll post it to our website. Uh, so if you have to drop off early or anything like that, or if there's somebody else that you want to hear the, the presentation. But uh, Comlink has uh, been around now for oh, probably close to a decade, and uh, there are some changes coming with it. So that's why we wanted to have Tom come and, and do this, uh, this webinar. So, Tom, with that, I turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks for the invite. For those of you on the call who I have not had the pleasure to meet, I've uh, been on the job for about 18 months now, working here in Patrick Henry Building in Richmond. And one of the big projects that I've tackled uh, in collaboration with a lot of folks, to include Melissa, uh, is how do we reinvigorate our, our Comlink program. So with that, I'll go ahead and roll through my slides. I think I have an hour scheduled, but I don't think it will take that long. Um, if anyone has a question, feel free to just go ahead and ask. Um, it's not a problem. So let me get started here. Here's the agenda, uh, which you can read just as well as I can, so I won't I won't read through it. But I want to start uh, with background, kind of work through you know multiple things that we've got underway, uh, and hopefully provide you with a good update. <clears throat> so you know, Steve touched on it very briefly, but you know, what is Comlink? Uh, in its most simplistic definition, it's a, it's a means by which using voice over internet, we can patch disparate LMR systems that normally would not be able to communicate with each other. Um, it is an interoperability system that uses the Rios platform, which is produced by the SciTech Corporation out of Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, it's, it's fairly popular. It's since its inception around 2006, 2007 time frame within regions three and six. It's grown across the Commonwealth. Uh, we have about 130 subscribers to include a couple federal agencies. Um, and it continues to actually uh, grow in popularity as region five begins to purchase um, Rios units to install within their localities. Uh, a lot going on right now. This is a, a packed slide, and I'll take my time to talk through it. Uh, I do have some other slides to back up uh, this list, so I may hold back a little bit. Um, but, again, feel free to stop me at any point if you have a question. Um, a big piece to this is governance, obviously, and, and that really hinges on a, a vibrant um, Comlink advisory group. And that that group has been a little has been inactive for a couple of years. Um, our our biggest thing with that is is getting it back online, reinstituting that. So to jumpstart that, we thought we needed to take a look at the the user subscriber MOA. Uh, the MOA was originally published in 2012. So we put together a working group of a lot of folks, uh, numbered over. 20. Uh, Melissa's part of that. And we would do a series of conference calls and webinars to go through that document and update it and make it relevant again, uh, covering everything from maintenance support, training, daily operations, uh, control of the equipment, so on and so forth. And I've got slides that will delve into some of those facets more. Uh, we have gone through that MOA now, the working group, and um, I'm going to have the Office of the Attorney General here in Richmond go through it just to, to QC it, um, to make sure it does not overstep in any way illegally. 
and then provide it to the localities who currently subscribe to the Comlink network. Um, that group, that working group, will then morph, it will then shift into being that advisory group that I mentioned earlier. And that advisory group will become a permanent body that will meet uh, at a minimum quarterly to review ongoing Comlink issues, challenges, um, using the MOA kind of as that bedrock, if you will, to underpin the entire program. Um, I do want to get out regionally and meet with the subscribers. I think to send out the MOA blindly and expect people to sign off on it, agree to it, is naive and, and not appropriate. So um, later this year, I'll go ahead and announce regional workshops where I will uh, invite subscribers for the applicable region to gather in one physical location, review the MOA, address questions. Also invite SciTech to be there uh, to provide a demonstration on uh, the latest version of the RIOS, uh, the applications for it. Um, they, they are putting out something called RIOS Lite, which I won't really delve into, but it's, it's something that's compatible with handheld uh, broadband devices, i.e. Uh, iPhones and whatnot, um, to enhance interoperability with those type of uh, technologies. So we'll have a one-day workshop just going over the MOA. Uh, we can talk maintenance issues, probably do some operator training as well. So hit, hit a, few, a few things of value for, for folks that use uh, the Comlink, the Rios platform. Uh, the second bullet service plan. So we, this is the first year we've had a formal service maintenance plan contract in place with SciTech. Prior to that, it was a combination of the goodwill of SciTech, uh, VSP technicians, and carryover of, for some folks who purchased the Rios and still had a, um, an initial maintenance agreement with SciTech. It was kind of a culmination of the three. Well, that obviously wasn't the right answer. We needed to have a formal service contract in place with SciTech that defined parameters of maintenance support. We have that in place now. Uh, the contract period began September of last year, runs for one, one year, um, obviously ending September of this year. We are going to begin negotiations for year two of that service contract, starting probably June, no later than July. Um, I am cautiously optimistic that the funding is in place for year two. Uh, there is growing support now that we've, we're beginning to reinvigorate a program that supports Comlink. Um, here at the state level that we'll be able to find um, that funding. Uh, as soon as I have that plan nailed down, then I'll be willing to share that publicly. But at this point, it's, it's still pre-decisional, but um, I am optimistic. So we've got that in the works. We had a mid-year review with SciTech in March. Myself, SciTech, and state police met, went through the current contract to see what they had accomplished. Bottom line, state police was happy. They were comfortable with what they were seeing from SciTech. So that was another um, measure of fidelity that we got back from SciTech, that the contract in place is working. We want to continue the relationship. So um, good news on that front. Data collection. Uh, until recently, we never had any quantitative or qualitative best case data uh, captured on how we use the the Comlink system, Rios, across the state day in and day out. And working with SciTech, they were very supportive of their programmers and developing programs that would capture transmissions, uh, although, other, otherwise known as patches, between two localities or between a locality and a state agency, predominantly state police so that we can show the value. Sorry about that. Um, my office overlooks Broad Street, and if you hear the siren, it's because we've got 
ambulances and whatnot running up and down Broadway, Broad Street uh, from the VCU hospital. Um, collecting data that shows best case uh, examples of how we use uh, Comlink both for planned and unplanned events, day in, day out, and then a measure quantitatively of how we're using it. Um, that informs state leadership and potentially down the road to General Assembly on the value of Comlink. Training. Um, the number one concern I heard from folks was, was training. If we don't have training, we don't use it. If we don't use it, it loses relevancy. And then we don't have, if it's not relevant, why we even have it? So it's kind of like a chain reaction that all starts with sustainable, realistic training. Um, Carol Adams, working with Bill Purcell with SciTech, has done a tremendous job of advancing, reinvigorating, realistic, value-added, operator training that just focuses on the nuts and bolts, give me practical how-to skills on how to use this thing uh, day in, day out. Um, for those of you that don't know, Carol has uh, recently transitioned uh, to a new opportunity, and um, I'm working with her to figure out how we can still continue the training. Um, she is very supportive, obviously, of Comlink and public safety in the Commonwealth, and I'm optimistic that we can probably, at a minimum, work out quarterly workshops where we can invite folks to come and conduct um, operator training. So we're still going to do training. We just we got to come up with a different strategy, and, and we'll figure it out because really training underpins so much of, of what we do with Comlink and the future of it. Sustainability. Um, already touched on that to some degree, but part of telling the story of why we need to advance Comlink in some way, um, ironically, you, you've got to, you've got to challenge what you're doing right now. You know, IE is, is, is the Rio's platform still the best game in town? So how we intend to do that is probably release an RFI later this year just to see what else is out there in the industry that could provide a comparable replacement theoretically to what we have right now. I, we're going to do that just so that when we go to the General Assembly um, during the next bi biennial um, budget process, you know, and they ask the question, hey, is what you've purchased over a decade ago in some cases, is that still the best technology out there? And the answer probably is going to be yes. However, to answer that truthfully, you've got to do your homework. So um, I just wanted to touch on that. You do hear about that. Um, that, is, that, is the, that is the rationale behind doing an RFI. Uh, the other thing, the other part, there's two facets to sustainment. There's, there's looking at a system-wide refresh, which is what the RFI talks to, you know, is this platform still the best game in town? And then there's the other piece, which is just the yearly maintenance plan. At some point, we're going to have to shift from using grant dollars to fund the state maintenance contract, which is what we're using right now. We're using uh, state homeland security grant program uh, dollars to to fund the annual maintenance contract. As we all know, grants are on a downtrend. They continue to dry up, and, the, and conversely, the requirements just continue to grow, the competing demands for that, for that limited dollar. So I've been directed to look at a long-term cost share solution where localities who would choose to remain subscribers to the Comlink network would pay some amount of money to fund that um, maintenance pro maintenance contract and we based probably based upon population and rough order of magnitude estimate would be probably for locality about four thousand dollars a year it's just a very rough estimate uh, obviously, it would shift based upon population, whether you're urbanized, rural, somewhere in between. Um, another part of sh 
sharing the relevancy of Comlink, the value of it, and why we need to keep funding it is an information campaign is to get engaged with the localities via VML and BACO. Uh, I am scheduled to speak at both of their conferences in the fall about interoperability, and obviously we'll touch on Comlink. And then, as I mentioned, also engage with the General Assembly, uh, specifically look at um, trying to get um, a budget line item um, placed in there for some quantity of money, understanding that, you know, that's that's a very challenging environment, obviously, but at least make the attempt. And to support that, it's, you know, do your homework, do an RFI, prove that uh, it is still the best platform out there. Uh, it's valuable. We've got the data to back it up. We can show you quantitative and qualitative data that, that backs it up on a daily basis as being valuable to the Commonwealth for public safety interoperability. And um, get the good new, get the good word out there via VML and VACO to generate some uh, some more support out there with the localities. So I'll just kind of delve into this some of these matters that I already talked about, some of these issues I talked about on the previous slide a little bit more in the, in the balance of the brief uh, service contract. It's specifically for Cytex proprietary. Um, Equipment, probably no big surprise there, but at some point, you know, um, their, their span of maintenance support stops when you get into the non-proprietary hardware and software that the locality may have purchased. Obviously, they're not going to touch that stuff, so it's specifically SciTech equipment. Uh, also, it does not cover upgrades. Uh, a lot of the Rios units out there, um, more even more so for like regions three and six, who were the first areas to come online, um, their stuff has re has really met the end of the service, the expected service life, and uh, required upgrades are obviously needed, but aren't going to be covered by the, the service contract. Service contract, I mentioned that already, it ends September of this year. Um, key takeaways: if you do need maintenance support, your first call should be to the state police. Knock. That's your start point. Um, I've got a couple flow charts that I'll, you'll see that I won't go into detail. They're a little bit uh, hard to read on the screen, I think. But if you do get a copy of this brief, you can print off hard copies. So your first call should be to the NOC if you have an issue. And then they'll triage your issue, basically, and decide whether they can solve it themselves or do they need to escalate it to SciTech. And they've got that process all worked out between them and SciTech. So I would... I would highly recommend start with state police knock and let them take it from there as required. Uh, also, for any new acquisitions, you know, as I mentioned, Region 5 is, is looking to buy some units. Um, if you're anticipating a new acquisition, uh, keep DSP in the loop. If anything, we've got a plan as we look at future iterations of our maintenance contract to make sure that um, your, your site is incorporated after your initial one-year uh, maintenance contract that's built into your initial buy with SciTech expires. So just just a couple points there to, to, to bring to your attention. Okay, here's the first flow chart, uh, Comlink tech support process flow. Um, I won't try to read that to you. You can do that on, on at your convenience, but I would recommend actually printing this this flow chart out in the next one and just keeping them handy that you can refer to as required. So this one right here is for tech support. Uh, again, start with a call to the NOC. You've got their contact information there at the top. Uh, the second one is for a site upgrade modification or a new site implementation. So uh, a little bit more straight-lined, simpler process, but bottom line is please keep the state police in the loop. One thing that the maintenance contract uh, calls for is to do an asset inventory site assessment. That's really to give us a baseline across the board. Um, one thing SciTech has encountered is just some of the PSAPs out there um, may not be aware that, you know, SciTech is in the neighborhood. Uh, sometimes Bill, Bill Purcell, who's leading this up, you know, he'll, he'll, he may be in the area, not originally expecting to be able to do a visit, but uh, he has the time, so he may swing by. So just spreading the word that SciTech is trying to get out there and look uh, at what equipment is out there for us to give us that baseline. They've been to a lot of the sites, but there's probably a few they have not. So just, just a heads up on that. If 
don't be surprised if, uh, if Bill Purcell shows up at your front door. Um, we're finding already uh, maybe some long-term issues, maintenance issues that maybe the site, just because they don't use site, uh, use the Rios a lot or um, folks that knew how to use it moved on and they just, it just kind of fell to the wayside. Uh, we're able to, we are able to get out there, either state police or um, Bill Purcell from SciTech and his, his colleagues to try to do some repairs. Um, we've had some success stories out there with folks who, you know, didn't use it for a couple of years. And uh, now that it's up and running and they've gotten some training on it, they're starting to employ it. So there's the good news stories are starting to come in. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the baseline and identifying just, okay, who out there is using it. We've got about 130 subscribers, uh, and it's growing, as I mentioned. Um, so this is, this is good. This is all part of just trying to get our arms back around this and what we're dealing with. <clears throat> Uh, this, this kind of just kind of peels back the orange a little bit on the maintenance contract. Uh, I won't go through and read this, but this is just, this is a scope, if you will, for that mid-year review we did in March. And again, we went, you know, through, this is an, an, ex, an extract from the service contract we went through. And basically this was our report card and SciTech had to come back and answer each point on what they had been doing. And the overall assessment by state police is they were happy with what they were seeing. So we're moving forward with another another year um, maintenance contract. Sustainment funding, I talked about that already, declining um, dollars, grant dollars. It costs probably about 30 k to do a full refresh of the site. Uh, a Commonwealth-wide refresh will cost estimated about $3.4 million. Um, we here at the state level, we're, we're working on that as well, and I am cautiously optimistic that we're going to have a solution. Um, I'm not at liberty right now to go into the details, but if and when that plan is approved, I will be providing those details to to the Commonwealth via the interoperability network, um, the seat, the statewide interoperability committee and our regional committees to, to explain how we're going to conduct a refresh. It will probably be a multi-year endeavor done in phases, um, but I don't really want to give too many more details than that other than um, I am cautiously optimistic we're going to have a solution. So more to follow on that. That'll be obviously tremendous news um, if and when that does come to fruition. <clears throat> Looking at the Homeland Security uh, grant program, this slide just kind of backs up what I already said. You can kind of see from 2012 to 2014 what we normally have been getting for interoperability grants, some portion of which goes to Rios. Um, but the trend, you know, continues to, to go down, so we have to find other solutions, which um, led me to the points I made on the cost share plan that I'm working on and hope to be able to brief over the next couple of years and, and put into place. Understanding that localities, if they choose to opt in to that cost share model, would need time to plan to it with their uh, budget cycle. So the earliest we could realistically implement any any type of cost share solution for the maintenance contract sustainment would probably be summer of 2019. Talked about training. Uh, pretty much talked to the slide already. I did a survey, and that's really where this idea that training was the biggest problem came from was feedback. I sent a, a survey out, had 44 PSAPs respond, and training was number one at about 70%. 70% of the respondents said that training was the biggest concern they had. So, again, kudos to, to Carol and, and other folks out there like Melissa and Cheryl Buchanan in Hanover County for uh, really spearheading that for us. A couple of the questions I asked, uh, interesting, you know, surveys, everybody hates to do them, but when you do get the results back, they're interesting to look at. And um, you'll see my little 
parachutist there off on the corner. That's kind of an analogy I use for describing Comlink. It's something you may not need every day, but when you need it, you really need it. So um, that theory, that idea was, was, I think, supported by the results we got back from my unscientific survey, uh, which showed that while not many folks um, use it daily, a lot of them are going to use it at least quarterly, if not monthly. And probably about 80% of the folks, if it's not essential, they definitely consider it valuable and, and would like to keep it, I'm sure. So um, these these numbers kind of came back reinforcing what we what was always kind of our hunch, but um, it all goes back to being uh, being able to tell the story to decision makers such as such as those in the General Assembly. So metrics, measurements, uh, it tells our usage, tells our story. And that, I, maybe I went really fast, uh, only went about 20 minutes or so. So um, that's all I have, really. Um, are there any questions for me at this point? Okay, I guess I answered everybody's questions or they've had enough of Comlink for today. <laughs> Tom, it's uh, Steve Marzoff. So... Um, you know, Comlink's been around now for quite a while, and you said you're fairly optimistic that it's going to be around for the foreseeable future, correct? Yes, I agree. Um, so some piece I've seen when we go out and, and tour, um, you know, it's it's almost an afterthought. It's on another table. It's not integrated into the daily operation. Um, how are some of the ways you think that the that a, a, a typical PSAP or, or jurisdiction doesn't even need to be a, a PSAP, how they might actually use Comlink, um, you know, going forward, how how it will become a more essential piece of, of, of equipment for them. I, I think I think what they need to do is get more of the the operators, if you will, involved. It's it's great that folks that work within the PSAP are familiar with with Comlink, with the Rios, obviously, because they're the ones that will implement the patches. But if the folks out on the street who are responding to calls, the police officers, the firefighters, the EMS, if they know about the resource and that it's, that it's available to them, then they can request it. And I think that's to a large degree, the missing link to enhancing the relevancy of the Rios is not enough of our operators out there on the street making it happen every day are are cognizant of this capability that they can use to patch between a different locality who's supporting them and whatever the event is, or even in some cases within their own internal jurisdiction. So. Um, I've talked to folks about that, how we can, how we can better do a better job of that. Um, certainly, um, all ears to anyone on the call who might have some ideas, but if we can maybe go to more conferences, you know, the Fire Chiefs Conference, uh, Virginia Sheriff's Association Conference, and, and maybe conduct operator training there. So if folks want to send and just see how easy it is, how quickly this can be done if the, if the PSAP is, is trained up and ready to, to implement it, um, I think that would help with, with using it and for folks realizing the full capability of it. Uh, one of the, I guess, textbook examples of where the Rios would have been invaluable to enhancing the interoperability of various jurisdictions was um, the unfortunate incident we had on Smith Lake, the shooting, and the suspect was moving north on I-81 and was not apprehended, and I can't recall, but it was, he made his way pretty far up I-81. And in the after action, it came up that if, if localities had been able to coordinate, uh, a handoff as he moved north to provide situational awareness to all jurisdictions along I-81, um, they probably would have stopped him a lot sooner, and the Rios could have done that. The Rios would have allowed those jurisdictions to immediately establish patches amongst themselves so that um, 
enhanced situational awareness would have been provided uh, by linking temporarily those LMR networks to essentially simulcast information uh, about what was going on uh, pertinent to his, his movement up I-81. And that's all I got to say on that, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I think that's – I think it's important that uh, people understand the um, potential uses and, and what the day-to-day -day uses might be. Um, you know, sometimes when we look at uh, especially equipment like interoperability equipment as just for disasters and not necessarily for day-to-day -day use, we don't recognize um, – how it could benefit, uh, as you said, the, the first responders, the people on the streets, um, and, uh, and and they don't even know that it's a tool that they have available to them. Are there any other questions for, for Tom today? We we'll always try to be respectful of your time, and, and uh, you know, if that subject doesn't take an hour to, to present, then we're not going to take an hour, um, make it drag, drag on and on. So, um, Hearing no other questions, um, Tom, thank you for uh, uh, doing the uh, webinar Wednesday for us today. Um, there will be a recording of it available on our website in a, in a few days or a week or so. Um, and I'm sure Tom um, uh, wouldn't mind uh, any questions after the fact, um, you know, being sent to him. So um, if there aren't any other questions, thanks you, Tom. Thank everybody for participating, and uh, we'll be doing this again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.